Hey guys, my name is Int80. I'm the rapper in Dual Core. <laughs> I'd like to rap for you to intro this talk. Thanks for coming in. We're going to start with some baseline questions. What's your name and what do you do? I'm Int80. I'm the rapper in Dual Core. Where are you from? Cincinnati. And why are you here? Well, there's plenty of possibilities Explaining my guest appearance Investigating my clearance Up to test my perseverance Basically, I'm here Cause these feds just want to battle me Turning my brain waves Against my DIY mentality Looking for the pattern Of a hacker in the brain Or monitoring the heart rate Of a rapper in the veins Eyes on the prize While they're mapping all the waves These wires make me feel Like I'm shackled up in chains Keep pace Try to hide a change visibly Too fast for readings Gotta crank the sensitivity Heart rate, pressure, pulse Better not skip a beat Alchemy of science Magical the wizardry Show the source, let us see how they play Or I'll just disassemble and drop a zero day A red herring flaw lacking reasons for the claims Defeated in these games, so I'm seeking neon rain Who's the best rap group in Nerdcore? In the iTunes store? That's us, Dual Core Who makes the best beats rocking on the boards? Produce a high score C64 Who's the best rapper that's known to spit crazy? And baby kick baby Interrupt 80 And the number one hacker The infamous legend Who brings the end map Armageddon Gregory Evans? <laughs> Thanks Thank so, you so much That was the best introduction ever <laughs> Thank you So without further ado It's my pleasure And without further laptop hacks Or rage or frustration It's my pleasure to introduce Rain and U Urban Monkey uh, And they're going to show you Some really cool lie detector polygraph stuff Make some noise for them please Thank you so much Annette. You totally rock my world Thank you so much That was so awesome and thank you guys for waiting. I apologize for the technical difficulties. Um, so without any further ado, uh, I assume you guys all know by now that you're in uh, build a lie detector, beat a lie detector. Um, I'm, we were both from the Neuronumerous group. Joe Barry couldn't make it this year, so Urban Monkey uh, took the bullet and came instead. Um, and as Ian told you, this is actually my fifth year here speaking at DEF CON. So, Five years, so, y you know, some people get paper and stuff. I, I get a nerdcore, it's nerdcore uh, rap traditional for your introduction for your fifth year speech. So, but to uh, tell you the truth, I really almost didn't make it this year. Now, I know that neuronumerous every year, there comes with the madness of pulling things off at the last minute. That is part of our charm. Uh, but truth be told, I really wasn't feeling it this year. So, for several reasons, I had become so disillusioned with the whole concept of neurohacking that I actually wanted to uh, quit it completely. So, my dear friend and fellow member, Tottenkoff, who I know is here somewhere, um, she told me that the problem is I've just been pushing myself too hard lately, working on these year-long projects to bring to you guys. So, um, she actually suggested to me that I take this year off. Um, and um, so, since I've accidentally ended up in the shoes of being Neuronumerous' spokesperson, it really didn't go over well with the rest of the group that I wanted to take a year off. Because how it works is we start working on our projects. As soon as I walk off this stage, we will be working on the next project. So it was really unfair to Urban Monkey and the rest of the group that I was like, I'm out. So a huge argument started with how much obligation I actually had to the group. And this caused a major riff. The infighting was crazy. Um, and the polygraph project actually ended up in the back burner for uh, many, many months while this was going on. So finally, Psychedelic Bike, who's painfully brilliant, by the way, he's a painfully brilliant man, he came up with a solution, a way that I could both take a year off and still be a spokesperson for the group. And it was really simple. The idea was we would just build a robot to download my memories into and no one would be the wiser while the real rain stayed home eating bonbons and having a well-deserved rest. So at what point did you figure out I was lying to you? Was there something subtle that seemed off in my story before it obviously went down the path of the improbable? Did my body language tip you off? Did I show any stress gestures? Was I blinking? Swallowing too hard, fidgeting. I'm always fidgeting, so I mean. Um, did my story lack in detail? How about my vocal pitch? Was there anything off about that? 
Too many pauses, perhaps? Then again, how much of what I just told you was a lie? All of it? Some of it? None of it? More than three decades of uh, psychological research has shown that most individuals are horribly bad at figuring out when they're being lied to. The average person does barely any better than chance. Um, but you, don't, you can't blame them because there's no universal, unique, telltale sign that someone is lying to you, no matter what you've heard. Uh, but don't feel too downheartened about it. Um, even if you are a police officer, or a judge who had been trained in the art of detecting deception, the training might improve your accuracy, but it would only be a few percentage points at the most. So it shouldn't come as a surprise that detecting lies is complicated, because lies themselves are complicated things. A lie is not in the words we say, after all, or even in the lack of words. It's in the attention of the deceiver. However offensive this concept may be to you, deception comes naturally in all living things. Camouflage being only one of the many examples of how nature amply rewards successful deceivers by allowing them to survive long enough to mate and reproduce. According to the calculations made by a psychologist at the University of Southern California, human beings are lied to about 200 times a day. That works out to roughly one untruth every five minutes. So figure out what the last one I just told you was. Next slide. So, Throughout history, the truth has been a slippery thing for us to put our fingers on. And the progress of the human race has always been darkened by the self-made horrors of humans designed, found within severe mental and physical pain, that one group of human beings can seemingly without remorse or judgment uh, put another group of human beings to in the name of justice. So, from ancient times to the Middle Ages, dramatic laws were essentially unwritten tribal customs that evolved from popular practice that moved with the tribe. If property was stolen or someone was injured or killed, a payment would be made um, to the guilty person to pay the victim or the families of the owner of property. This payment was a price that was considered amends. I'm sure you've all heard of blood money. So uh, that was to pay off to make amends. It was within dramatic law that the ordeal came to be a means by which the accused may clear themselves. Um, Tribal ordeal was a practice that the guilt or innocent of the accused was determined by subjecting them to unpleasant, usually a dangerous experience. In some cases, the accused was considered innocent if they survived the test or if their, if their injuries healed. In other cases, only death was considered proof of innocence. The reasoning went that those who had done nothing wrong would be kept from harm by divine intervention. Even if the accused happened to die during the ordeal, it was still considered at the time to be entirely fair because everyone knew that they'd go on to a suitable reward or punishment in the afterlife. Trials for ordeal became rare over the Middle Ages because it was often uh, replaced by confessions under torture. Um, so you can decide whether or not that was a trade-up. Uh, but the practice was discontinued only in the 16th century. So, sorry about my slides being cut off. Um, nobody reads them anyway, we all know that. Uh, trial by combat was a method of dramatic law to settle accusations in the absence of witnesses or a confession, in which two parties in dispute fought against each other in combat, and the winner of the fight was proclaimed to be right. So it remained in use uh, throughout the Middle Ages, gradually disappearing in the course of the 16th century, like trial by ordeal. But interestingly enough, trial by ordeal is generally known in one form or another in many cultures worldwide. And um, trial by combat was probably a custom of the Germanic people. Now to the Greeks and the Romans, the truth was something impersonal, separate from, and greater than an individual. And most certainly greater than an individual who is of low status or had been born into a captive birth. <laughs> the truth was thought to, be, to reside not only in the witnesses' words, but to be locked within their living flesh. And it was the torturer's task to pry out it through the medium of pain. Now, I know to you that the belief of extreme pain was a guarantee of the truth seems crazy counterintuitive uh, because to us today, because our instincts tell us that a tortured witness would agree to absolutely anything. But what you need to understand that is that our present view is rooted in the very modern philosophical sense that the individual self, as an autonomous being, is in the possession of its own truth. Now, 
The invention of the police did not come without growing pains, and early uh, American police departments were typically brutal and corrupt. During the early part of the 20th century, the routine torture used by American domestic police when it came to dealing with deception was given the quaint nickname of the third degree. Confessions obtained by using such techniques as bright lights, deprivation of food, physical discomfort, long isolation, and beating with instruments that didn't leave marks uh, were usually immiscible in court as long as someone signed a piece of paper that was a waiver saying that they had done it voluntarily. Between the 1930s and the 1960s, a national uproar actually began, uh, and, that, uh, and they started cracking down on police tactics and gradually changed the practice of police interrogation. So by the 1950s, uh, the confessions were considered involuntary, not only if the police had actually harmed the suspect, but had also caused what they considered mental harm by depriving them of sleep, food, water, or bathroom facilities. It promised them some benefit if the subject confessed or threatened them with harm if they didn't confess. In the world today, we rely on a legal system to sort our, our liars from our truth tellers. Two of the most commonplace legal systems are the adversarial system and the inquisitorial system. I'm going to hate saying that through the whole speech. Inquisitorial, inquisitorial. Um, in the adversarial system, two or more opposing parties gather evidence and present the evidence. This is a bad stapling job. Present the evidence and the arguments to judge or jury. The judge or jury knows nothing of the, the litigation until the parties present their case to the decision makers. The defendant in a criminal trial is not required to testify. But in the inquisitorial system, the presiding judge is not a passive uh, recipient of the information. Rather, the presiding judge is primarily responsible for supervising and gathering the evidence necessary to resolve the case. He or she actively steers the search for evidence and questions the witness, including the respondents or defendants. Uh, attorneys play a more passive role, and they suggest routes of inquiry for the presiding judge to follow the judge questioning, and then they follow it with a tiny bit of questioning of their own. The reason the attorneys don't question too much is, and is very brief is because the judge tries to ask all the relevant questions, so they're kind of just add-ons. So basically, the adversarial system, which of course is the system in America, seeks the truth by pitting parties against each other in a hope that competition will reveal uh, uh, the truth. And it places a premium, right, like a premium on the individual's rights. But the inquisitorial system seeks the truth by questioning those most familiar to the events in the dispute and placing the rights of the accused secondary for the search of the truth. So as you can see, our efforts as a society have changed through the years in the way that we treat those that we believe to deceive us. But since the early 1900s, science has endeavored to create more human, a more human method to unravel the tales of deceivers. So, the modern polygraph as we know it was developed near the end of the 1920s uh, and would change very little over the coming decades. Its creators were not the first people to use scientific instrumentation as an aid in detecting lies or monitoring blood pressure during questioning. In fact, they weren't even the first to use the word polygraph to describe the device. They were, however, the first to put it in a portable form for use in the field and the first to design and market specifically for police application. Another thing that made this particular polygraph attractive was that it could potentially replace the existing brutal third degree method which had been brought to the public's attention through media during the first couple of decades of the 1900s. Such bad publicity had been putting a great deal of public pressure on police departments. Initially, the polygraph was limited to a small number of police departments, but its use slowly spread along with its reputation. There was little attention focused on the polygraph by the general media in the 1920s, though a few articles published were almost always positive. During the 1930s, use of the lie detector began to slowly move into other areas of use, with a ghoulish example being its use on death row inmates uh, being given exams as a consideration uh, when determining a stay of execution. Um, 
the use of the machine, though, was still mainly limited to a small number of police agencies and some minor use through other government agencies. Um, but it was beginning to see an increase in use in, this, in a small number of businesses in the private sector. During the 1930s, most of the media accounts were still full of praise for the polygraph, with very little criticism and attention being devoted to its level of accuracy or reliability. This despite the fact that the developers and proponents of the device were all members of the academic world. Concerns on its effects to rights to privacy and the right to not self-incriminate arose very rarely. Um, as the 1940s began, so did the polygraph's growing amount of publicity and media coverage. Though the majority of the number, numbers released on how successful the machines were coming from the polygraph industry itself. The accuracy of the device was still rarely challenged. One of the reasons for this was its continued rejection of polygraphs in the court system. With all of the major names in the field either shifting their attention away from or dying, uh, combined with the court's rejection of its results, the polygraph may have been expected to continue to fall out of favor. However, as the middle of the 1940s marched into the 1950s, use of the device by businesses and governments would soon substantially increase as the paranoia over the Cold War and McCarthyism spread. Now, as we all know, the middle and late 1950s was a time of great distrust and false accusations. This environment would bring a sharp increase in use of the polygraph, especially by the federal government and then slowly spreading to other levels of government. That in turn led to more media attention of the instrument and a small but growing number of critical articles began to question the fundamental principles behind the polygraph itself. The days of its complete uncritical acceptance were passing. As demand grew, so did the number of private polygraph firms. Uh, and most of the numbers generally cited as proof of the instrument's accuracy were still industry generated. During this time, we also saw the emergence of challenges being issued to submit to the machine. For the first time, attention was being paid to the use of the polygraph for intimidation and political, political ends rather than as a deception detecting means. Through the 1960s, the use of the polygraph would continue to spread, especially in the federal government and the private sector. Both its usage and complaints of its use began to increase as the extent, to the extent that Congress became involved by holding hearings, issuing reports, and making recommendations on the polygraph. Individual states began to limit the use of the instrument and to license operators. As in the past, though, courts continued to reject results as evidence, uh, and business use began to dramatically increase uh, especially in the pre-employment uh, testing of job applicants, as this group of people were not unionized and had no protection against it whatsoever. A greater portion of attention was becoming critical as opponents began to point out the glaring faults and deficiencies of the instrument, and the fact that the rapid increase in use had been based on little more than claims of the polygraph industry itself. Many articles during this period were definitely in favor of the machine, but even those writers felt compelled to at least mention some of the faults and some of the criticisms. Although the government continued to use the instrument, the 1970s saw media interest mainly focused on business use of the device, as employee polygraph screening, screening became a multi-million dollar industry. The attraction of the polygraph for businesses seemed to be its relatively low cost uh, and quick speed in comparison with traditional investigation of job applicants. Legal activity continued as more states took action and the federal government threatened but failed to enact any legislation. During the early 1980s, court use of the polygraph began to see some minor gains, despite the fact that criticism against it had dramatically increased. In addition to being widely reported that polygraph results were being used by prosecutors in determining who to prosecute and in plea bargains, in a number of jurisdictions, rape charges would not even begin to be investigated until the victim had submitted to and passed a polygraph exam. Federal use of the polygraph increased during the 1980s, drawing a great deal of media coverage, most of it highly critical. It took until 1988 
until use of the polygraph in most business applications was curtailed by federal law, even though criticism and of the accuracy and validity had been building for years. One may have expected that the polygraph would begin to fade away with the passing of the Employee Polygraph Protection Act, um, all but abolishing the private sector's ability to use it, but it didn't. Uh, government continued to use the device through the 1990s, and in 1998, a Supreme Court ruling left it up to individual jurisdictions whether polygraph results could be submitted as evidence in a court case if both parties agreed to its use and at the judge's discretion. But it was really the unfortunate tragedy of uh, September 11th that would really breathe new life into the continued use of the polygraph. Um, last year, uh, as a group, the Newer Numerous group built a sleep lab, uh, and we built it from scratch. Uh, for the project this year, it was decided that building and designing schematics from scratch is just a lot of work, uh, and we wanted to do what we could do to avoid doing it again. Um, so after some quality time with Google, a keyboard, and some coffee, um, Rain came across a project out of Cornell University um, by Jordan Crittenden and Edward Lai. Um, there is a URL, you just can't see it, sorry. Um, so it was, was decided that this would be a good opportunity to use as a starting point for our project, uh, since they built theirs for less than $50, uh, and that fit our budget of paperclip pretty well. Jordan Edwin's design measured pulse rate, galvanic skin response, or GSR, breathing rate, and stress of the, the individual's voice. Uh, ours was built mostly from their schematics, although an existing piece of hardware generously provided by Seth Hardy was used for reading pulse rate. Uh, and we also didn't measure um, voice stress level. We also ended up using a slightly different method to record breathing rate. Uh, the Cornell design initially used a thermistor mounted on a dust mask, uh, which we also included in our initial build out. Uh, which psychedelic, psychedelic Bike did. Uh, however, we decided to add our own touch. Um, another member, Ole Grover, designed a breathing band um, that works pretty much like the commercial machines do by going around your chest. Um, at the core is a simple slide potentiometer, uh, which is probably the most single most expensive part of the device. Uh, the rest is simply a plastic box, a spiral uh, phone cable, phone jack, an elastic band, and ribbon with cable with straps to, to help hold it around the chest, and of course, to make it China compliant, hot glue. Um, you can't really see the, the at the bottom of this, the slide is where the, the phone cable plugs in. Um, initially, the band itself was designed with uh, an elastic band all the way around the chest, but there was a tendency for that to bind uh, and it didn't really have the tension to properly pull um, on the slider for the pot potentiometer. After some experimentation, you see the result on the screen there. It's just ribbon and elastic band. Um, the spiral phone cord was used, again, because it's cheap, um, but it was also thought that it would helpful, be helpful for people moving around uh, just to get the stretch out of the cable, which was dead bang on. We also decided that instead of laying out all of the components on a single board like the Cornell guys did, it would be sleeker to have a box like you see. Um, it was a pain in the ass. What we didn't think about was that opening and closing the box all the time would cause movement on the wires, causing signal crossover, which gave us some really odd results at times. Um, so if you do end up building one, uh, don't use a box. It's just, it'll be easier for you. Um, after getting it built and tested, um, if you see at the bottom there, that microcontroller is an Atmel controller. It, it is labeled, but you can't see the label, unfortunately. Um, after we'd built it, we found that Jordan and Edwin recommended not to power the machine from a wall and to use a battery to power it. Uh, it was something about safety. Um, even after figuring this out, after reading it, we totally ignored it. Um, if you do decide to build one, please read their webpage just so that you understand the safety concerns that they had in powering it from the wall. Uh, the software that we, the Cornell team used was written in MATLAB. Um, although another numer numer numerous member, Christian Gruber, wrote ours in Java because that's what he knows. Uh, it also allowed him to develop on his Mac and easily deploy it to our Ubuntu box that we used. Um, while it is possible to run the software on a Mac, 
because data is sent over a serial port, uh, you'll need to use a USB to serial adapter uh, running at 384. Um, some of the cheaper ones don't do that speed, so just be careful if you do end up buying one, which, what you buy. Um, if you're doing this on Windows, the software wasn't designed for Windows, so it, at your own peril. Uh, the user interface was built using JCC Kit and Java Builder Swing. Um, overall, the software can be built with the Apache Maven project. Uh, we were using version 2.2.1, uh, although any version higher should work, uh, with, as, long with, as well as Java 1.6. Um, the source code is available, as you see, uh, at code.google.com slash p slash neuronumerous. Uh, it's built using the Mercurial source control system. Uh, and all of our software is open source. Uh, once this was built, running and collecting data, we were quickly running out of time. Uh, our cry for lab rats was thankfully answered by 16 people, including myself, through mid-July of this year, uh, giving Psychedelic Bike, the gentleman who built the machine, uh, about one week to go over data that was written out by hand by rain. So now you've seen our beautiful ghetto polygraph, you know, uh, very beautiful. Um, so uh, when we took special care to try and make sure um, that our testing environment would be as close to the polygraph industry standards as possible, right? Because, you know, we, we totally wanted to be able to uh, have data that would be comparable. Um, we tried to keep the environment quiet with few distractions. We limited the amount of people allowed in the room during the time uh, the examination took place, so that was a variable that wouldn't uh, interfere. Uh, standards dictate that the room temperature should be between 70 to 75 degrees Fahrenheit for the Americans we had in the room. Uh, that works out to 21 to 24 degrees Celsius for the rest of the world. Um, unfortunately, at the time we were doing testing, the city that we both live in was in the midst of a heat wave. So if you remember that we told you that galvanic is a, a variable that works on sweat, so we... Um, we did try to make sure we didn't take any polygraph testing during the worst of it, but it'd be disingenuous, well, it would definitely feel disingenuous to me if I didn't tell you that during the worst of the heat wave, there were times that uh, our testing environment could be up to three degrees hotter than what was recommended by the industry. But I, we didn't see any major change between the times that it was hotter and what it wasn't. Um, but I did want to tell you that, just so, you know, uh, full disclaimer. Now, because the standard polygraph actually takes up to three hours to complete, uh, we kept it really simple by instead going with a uh, common pretest by polygraph examiners known as the numbers test. So, how the numbers test works is that you're asked to lie to the examiner about a number. Um, so, the polygraph examiner gives you a piece of paper and a pen, and he says, I want you to write down a number that's in between these three numbers. Pick four, five, or six. And so you write your chosen number down on the piece of paper. And the polygraph examiner can see what you've written down. It's no secret uh, to what you've written down. So after you've written your number down, you're hooked up to the machine. They let you get comfortable. And then the examiner uh, will, uh, th so the examiner tells you, I want you to answer no to every question I ask. So. Of course, the examiner will say, did you write down the number one? And then, of course, you're supposed to say no. So the examinee will say no. About 25 seconds later, the examinee will ask, did you write the number two? And of course, you say no. So, so on and so on and so on until the examiner progresses up to seven. So if you remember, you wrote down four, five, or six, which is actually quite close to seven as a variable for where he's looking. So this is supposed to give an idea of what the data would look like if the examinee was telling the truth compared to what your data looks like if the examinee is lying. So Neuronumerous came to the agreement that we would run our own version of the numbers test to collect data. Uh, we decided that what would make most sense for our purpose is that uh, we do two tests. We, did one, we would do one as a control group of what the polygraph data looks like if you just ran the numbers test, right, on someone. And the second we would see what happened is if we ran countermeasures against the machine. Uh, so the person who's playing the part of the examiner in our homebrew test, who was me, because I actually ended up losing a game of rock, paper, scissors, lizard, spock, urban monkey, 
Yeah, I was freaking paper disproving Spock. But anyway, uh, before the te first test started, I would hook a person up to the machine, and I'd ask them to visualize in their head, I didn't have pen and paper, so I asked them to visualize in their head a number between one and 10. So uh, they would be told when we start the test that um, you know, uh, they would be hooked up, they would get comfortable, we wouldn't start the test until they were ready. Um, and so uh, I would pause for second, second, uh, seven, several seconds so they could get comfortable for the next question. So um, the second test was run the same as the first, but this time when they answered no to every question in the number sequence, we had uh, the subject run countermeasures to try to fool the machine. Um, now, a countermeasure can be broadly described as anything that an examinee might do in order to distort or defeat a polygraph test. So, literature suggests that all polygraph countermeasures can be grouped into four categories. So, you have physical countermeasures, mental countermeasures, chemical countermeasures, and behavioral countermeasures. So, how it works is, as a rule, any method that involves muscular movement as its central feature can be considered a physical countermeasure. Some countermeasure movements would include increasing or releasing of muscle tension, actions that induce pain, uh, muscular activities that deplete the body's energy resources, and alterations in your breathing. Uh, mental countermeasures are those that draw upon uh, psychological manipulations exclusively in order to alter the physiological responses uh, that accompany deception. Mental countermeasures can be further subdivided into the following techniques, hypnosis, biofeedback, placebos, desensitization, mental disposition, rationalization, dissociation, and cognitive overloading. Now, chemical countermeasures are exactly what you expect them to be. You rely on drugs to heighten or dampen physiological uh, arousal during the polygraph examinations. And when it comes to behavioral countermeasures, their principal function is to convince the examiner that the subject is not being deceptive, uh, ir uh, regardless of what the machine is recording. Another function is to affect the conduct of the examination so the data would be inadequate in order for them to render a decision. So, with so many options to choose from, um, the, we wanted to keep our variables consistent and make everybody use the same countermeasures. So, we went with what we hope would be easiest to do and could be picked up by the subjects immediately and it would give them enough variety that they could choose among the options for one that would actually give them a sense of comfort, right? Um, the three options were biting their tongue, visualizing, uh, visualizing thoughts that would make their heart beat faster, and I actually had to ask my friends to flex their anal sphincter muscle for me. That tells you that they're very good friends. So, during the testing phase, um, we did find that countermeasures could uh, affect the result of the polygraph test, but because we only had seven days before I'm here, like, in front of you, uh, we didn't have enough time to thoroughly go through the data as much that I would feel comfortable saying that we came to an uh, official response. Um, but unofficially, I would definitely say that our results, uh, they didn't contradict the, the 2003 National Academy's science report that concluded that countermeasures pose a potentially serious threat to the performance of polygraph testing because all physiological indicators measured by the polygraph can be altered by conscious effort and through cognitive or physical means. So really, even though we're talking about a polygraph and the machine, uh, the bread and butter of all polygraph examinations is the questioning process. One of the early versions they used in the early days was the irrelevant, irrelevant technique, which mixed, they mixed questions like, did you murder so-and-so with, is today Tuesday? So um, they actually had to get rid of it eventually um, because even though the premise was lies in response to relevant questions would cause a physiological reaction, the problem was in this context that uh, the questions could be stressful enough to produce a result that showed people were lying when they're not. Okay, and because uh, we started late, I'm gonna be talking quick as possible. So, the comparison question technique, they got around this by making all the que questions uh, accusations. Uh, a sex crime investigation, for instance, the suspect would be asked the embarrassing question as, have you committed a sexual act that you were ever ashamed of? 
uh, as, well, as well as the relevant questions to the case. So um, the point of it was the fact that the people who were guilty, uh, would they would get a spike for the guilty questions, and everybody else was supposed to be embarrassed by these questions. So they were supposed to spike at a different time. The guilty knowledge question was they would show you like pictures of guns and try to figure out if you uh, had a spike compared to what the murder weapon was. So, okay, number seven. the fundamental puzzle of the speech I'd really like you to ponder now that we've spent this time together is whether or not we at Numer Numerous have actually built anything more than uh, a, a machine that collects physiological data. Um, after a near century of uh, polygraph research, there's not really anything else that I can tell you that you guys don't really know, other than the fact that the premise is faulty and it just everything that it's on is not reliable. The problem isn't that the machines don't record anything. They record stuff, and so does our machine. If you build one, you will absolutely record stuff. But the problem is that the numbers are up to human interpretation, and the people who are running these machines cannot be considered what one calls objective. So, uh, so the thing is, how the whole thing works in the United States is half of 50 states, you don't have to be licensed to be a polygraph examiner. Um, and there's no, uh, uh, there's no test across the board that actually, uh, that they do to fulfill the part. So depending on where we're located, we're probably just as qualified as anybody else in that state, and if not more qualified, depending on, um, uh, depending on if you decide building your own machine, that we would know it more thoroughly. So the point is, if you build the machine or if you buy the machine, in time and practice, you will beat the machine. And the thing about this machine is it's just a big polygraph, uh, a big biofeedback device. And as, uh, as a neurohacker, uh, being able to build this machine, you can actually have it and say that you're doing it for good health. You can learn how to beat the machine and not actually say that you're learning countermeasures because you're actually building a biofeedback machine for good health. So basically, if we could get a bunch of people together to build polygraphs or uh, their own biofeedback machines, they would be less inclined to be using polygraphs because we would be able to mess up with the variable of what they're using. So, I mean, you have to realize that it's been almost a century that the polygraph has been in use. So as neurohackers, if we could actually use something that we're supposed to be using towards self-improvement, and towards good health in order to be able to eventually make the polygraph obsolete. It really is uh, in our best interest to be able to do it. So, sorry I had to like really speed at the end of it, but that's basically it. So, if you build the machine and we have all the schematics and the code online, you will be able to be the polygraph. There is no doubt about that. Uh, but the fact that you could actually build one and say that you're doing it in the name of good health um, we'll definitely throw them. So thank you very much for uh, uh, having uh, your patience with me and everything's so late. Uh, and thank everybody else who uh, helped us. And um, good luck with uh, your biofeedback devices.